the cloud. All right. We are recording. All right. So, um, hello, everybody, and welcome to Gardening for Birds. Um, this is the first time that Trey and I have done this topic on our um, virtual space, and we're very excited to share with all of you. Um, what we know, what we've learned, and hopefully hear from some of you about what you, if there's anything else that you'd like to add. I know there's probably some avid bird watchers on the call with us. Um, so please feel free to share any of your knowledge at the end of the call. Um, all right, so let's get in. So first of all, I'm going to give a quick public service announcement um, about an invasive insect that has moved into our area. Then we're just going to get into the fun part gardening for birds. Um, so I'm going to be going over some basics and then Trey will be covering plants for birds and supplemental feeding and then we'll head into our discussion. All right, so um, this is the spotted lanternfly. This is an insect that is native to parts of Asia such as India and Bangladesh. Um, interestingly enough, it is invasive in areas such as Japan and Korea. So it has a pretty limited um, native range and then quickly will become invasive outside of it. It's a pretty large insect. This doesn't show it to scale at all, um, but it's about three quarters of an inch. The body's about three quarters of an inch long. And this is what it looks like, obviously, when it unfurls its wings. And I'll show you some other pictures um, later on. So it first was sighted in Pennsylvania in Berks County in 2014. Um, but they think that it actually was introduced to the state in around 2012 via shipping containers from China. And Pennsylvania was the first state that was infested with this invasive insect. So we are the ground zero for spotted lanternfly. Um, it's really important to know when you're dealing with this insect. I mean, it's big, uh, it's very beautiful, but it is not dangerous to humans. Um, in any physical way at least, maybe to our economy, but not to our bodies. Um, it doesn't have any parts that will bite or sting you. So the reason that we care about the spotted lanternfly is their feeding habits. So they're very voracious. Um, they also are very prolific um, reproducer or pro prolific in their reproduction. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, and so you know, they, they make a lot of them. The good news for us is that there's only one generation per year. So if we do get everybody educated about the different times that certain stages of insect are around, when eggs are around, when they can smush them, um, it will really help us to get control off the ground. So what they do is they have a proboscis that they um, stick into plants and they suck sap out of plants. They feed on lots of different um, variety of plants, such as um, they really like grapes. They also will feed on things like maple trees and vegetables in your garden. They really are not that particular. Um, their very favorite, though, is the ailanthus, which is the tree of heaven, which is another invasive um, species that is in Pennsylvania. And uh, Tree of Heaven, they, there's a lot of them in the area. They're very tall. They look similar to a walnut tree or sumac. They have that sort of same sort of leaf, leaf pattern, um, but the leaves are different and they have a little notch in them. And when you kind of crush them, they smell terrible. So that's one way to tell if that's a, um, a Tree of Heaven versus say a walnut or a sumac in your yard. If you're kind of a plant novice, that's a really easy way to do it. So they feed on these plants. Which is, which is bad, um, but often they don't usually kill the insect, the plant just from that. What really impacts a plant is a substance that they produce called honeydew, um, which is a very sticky, sugary substance that one, attracts a lot of stinging insects and ants and that kind of pest to your yard, but also um, it, mold will grow because of that, that um, honeydew, and then that covers the leaves and blocks photosynthesis, and that is what kills kills the trees. So they're a major problem in our area. And they're really good at clinging to surfaces. So they're really good at hitchhiking. Um, and a lot of the quarantine area, which I'll show you a map in a minute, is along um, major rail lines and also the Pennsylvania State Turnpike. So this is the different stages of a spotted lanternfly. I don't show the eggs here because they are um, 
out of season right now, you're not going to see any eggs. But um, the egg masses, they kind of, they're very gray in color. The eggs are laid in par parallel lines to each other along tree trunks, kind of up and down. And um, then they're covered in a, this gray putty-like substance that then cracks and really blends in well to tree trunks. Um, they will lay their eggs though on almost anything, including landscaping materials like concrete blocks, um, stones. They'll lay them on trucks, um, and anything they can get onto. Um, so it's really important that if you are moving within or without of Allegheny County to check your vehicle, do a quick little check um, for eggs. Eggs usually hatch by April, so it's going to be in late winter and early spring that you're going to want to do that check around your house and on your vehicles um, for those egg masses. Then they'll hatch into these little, these little early stage nymphs. They can be as small as a tick, um, so they can be kind of hard to spot. And then in July, they will switch to this late stage nymph um, called, these are called instars, um, and they become brighter red and pretty easy to spot because they're larger. Then the adult, this is an adult with closed wings and adult with the open wings. And you'll find them usually in masses. It's not very common to find just one um, spotted lanternfly. So you'll see a whole bunch of them. And again, they're rather large, they're easy to spot. And then they'll die off and they'll lay their eggs and then they'll die off in December. So this is a map of the counties that have quarantine in Pennsylvania. Um, this is where it was first spotted was Berks County and you can see it sort of traveled across to Allegheny County and there have been some sightings. Um, I know Pitt Karen they had some that they found there on railroad cars. Um, but the quarantine means that anybody with that it has a business that is moving vehicles either inside of or between counties, um, they have to have a permit for their car. Um, and in, in Nima Run, I am the permit person. So if you have questions about that, ask me and I can share information for your business. Um, so what do you do if you find one? First of all, take a picture and it's really good if you can have GPS enabled on your phone. If that's not possible, um, just try and take a really detailed um, description of where you spotted the insect or insects. Then you want to destroy it. So squish any eggs you find. Um, or you can scrape them into a bag, just like a credit card or something similar to that, you know, a, a hard object. Scrape them into a plastic bag, fill it with alcohol or hand sanitizer, close that bag, and then bag it again and throw it away. Um, it's, it's really important to double because they, they will be able to escape sometimes if you don't. So keep that in mind. And then just go ahead and kill all the nymphs and adults that you find. Lastly, it's really important to report it. And this is a link here that um, I can send out. I, we're going to be sending out a little sheet of information for everybody um, about the webinar and we'll be sure to include this link in the um, information. This basically links you to the Pennsylvania Ag Department of Agriculture site and they'll walk you through the steps to report any spotted lanternflies that you may see. So please make sure you take that really important last step if you find one. All right, now let's get into the fun part, um, gardening for birds. So it's a lovely photo here by Chrissy Jensa. She is a watershed resident. She lives in Regent Square and she took all of these in her, in her yard, I believe. Um, so gardening for birds is really important. Um, first off, for habitat creation. Um, you know, before we came here, birds and animals had the whole place free roam they could live wherever they wanted and as we we're slowly encroaching on their habitat it's really important that we give them safe and healthy spaces to live within our our space as well and share the love um, it's also important if you're a bird watcher because you want to see birds in your yard you know how are you going to draw them there if you don't have the correct plants and feeders and, and features in your yard so hopefully um, some of this knowledge will be put to use and you'll get a greater variety of creatures in your yard. So first off, um, when we're creating habitat, we wanna make sure that it is good habitat. So that means it needs to have a source of food, a source of water, and some sort of shelter. Now, all animals have different niches that they inhabit. So, you know, this, I believe this is a dove um, will be happy just in a nest and others need, other types of birds need um, burrows to live in. So 
you know, you want to make sure that you have a balance and also keep in mind the kind of birds you want to draw to your yard when you're making these considerations. Um, so Trey was wondering earlier why we had a picture of goats. And the reason I have these goats is that you can see that um, really these goats have everything they need. They're, um, they've got some water. You can see um, somebody drinking water here at the trough. Somebody's eating some shrubs. And there's plenty of places that they can curl up and hide and be protected from the wind and the snow. Now, is this good habitat? I'm going to argue no. Um, these are goats in Wales. Actually, this picture was taken in Wales just recently. Um, you can see a very few people out and about. That's because it was from a story in the New York Times about how, you know, while we're hiding out from COVID, animals are kind of taking back their space. So while the animals are here, I would, I would argue that maybe living in areas close to streets and, and where there's litter and stuff for them to eat is not the greatest place. So we wanna make sure we have good, healthy habitat. So first off, let's talk about food. Um, I love this picture of this bird. I don't know what kind of bird it is. If anyone on here does, please let me know. Um, but eating these grapes, um, it is the correct, it's supposed to be upside down. Uh, this bird is very determined to get to its food. Um, so first off, um, you want to be sure to have a wide variety of foods. So just like humans, um, you know, we don't all like to eat the same things, um, be that from, we're from different areas of the world or just our taste preferences. Um, you want to make sure you have a, a nice buffet for, for the creatures. Um, you want to have some sweet fruits. So sweet fruits, think of things like mulberries, cherries, other berries. Um, these are really important in the late spring and summer when they're rearing their chicks. They need that really high calorie food to feed to their babies. Um, next there's fatty fruits. So um, harder berries like viburnums or spice bushes, dogwood berries. Um, fatty fruits are important as they start to build up their mass and prepare for winter. And then persistent fruits um, such as, you know, conifers have the the seeds in their in their cones. Um, there's crab apples that usually persist over the winter. So these are these are also important things for them to have so that they can survive year round. Um, you also you want to plan for pollination. You're not going to get any food for your birds from your plants if they can't pollinate. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind are planting in clumps so that um, cross-pollination can occur when, when the bees and birds and bumblebee uh, and butterflies come to your plants, they can really spread the pollen around and get a good healthy um, sharing for those, those plants. Um, and it also looks nice to plant in small clumps. You don't want a huge swatch of something. You can, but again, smaller, like three, four plants together, um, and then create some visual appeal as well in your yard. Also, if you're thinking about planting fruit trees, you want to do so accordingly. So, you know, you, we have these things called monoecious and dioecious trees. Um, that means they're either self-pollinating, monoecious, they only need, it's like one house is the Latin or root of this word. So think apples, um, they're happy as a clam pollinating themselves. Um, squash are monoecious plants. They have male and female flowers. Um, but then there's dioecious, so they need two of the species, a male and a female, to correctly um, pollinate. So one terrible smelly example is ginkgo trees. They are dioecious plants. Now the dioecious is mulberries, very common around here. I have a mulberry tree in my yard, but it's obviously a male. I don't get any delicious berries. And persimmons are another dioecious. So if you're going to plant fruit trees, um, make sure that you go to a nursery that A, knows what they're talking about, and B, um, ask them to be sure that you are getting the right things. Um, and also, think about what native bees and butterflies might like to, to visit. Um, it's not just about the birds, it's an ecosystem, it all is interlinked together. And native bees and butterflies will really help make your yard much more prolific for the birds. Um, you can also draw native bees to your yard using things like mason bee houses. Um, and we did a webinar on that earlier. So if you have questions about native bees, please feel free to ask at the end and we can um, give you some more details on that. So shelter, 
Um, this is just an absolutely adorable picture of two baby owls um, sheltering from some rain. I just think they're so cute. Um, and so shelter, um, a couple things to consider. Plant evergreens. Um, they are, well, evergreens. They're green all year round. They provide really good protection from snow and sleet and that kind of thing from the birds in the winter and allows them to really create a space themselves where they can survive if they don't um, migrate. Um, I have a crow that has a really happy, beautiful nest in the white pine in my backyard. Also important to think about places to perch. Um, so these owls have a lovely little, you know, branch to perch on. Um, they also need places to sing so that they can attract mates and also to defend their territory. Um, so these are really important. So maybe don't cut down that dead tree in your yard. Don't trim off the dead branches right away um, if they're not going to be um, a burden to your house or, you know, endangering your house. Maybe leave those so that the birds have a place to hang out. Um, why is it not working? Um, also, traditional grass yards, um, we at Nine Mile Run are all about limiting traditional grass yards. Um, you know, number one, they take a lot of petro to, or petro chemicals, petro materials, oil to um, a mow. Um, you gotta if you have an electric mower, that's great, um, but also consider that when you are charging your electric mower, where's that power coming from? Um, it may be from a coal power plant, so that's still creating some pollution as well. Um, but a lot of, there's a lot of air pollution linked to lawnmowers. It's kind of amazing how bad they are for the environment. So that's one great reason not to have a big grass yard. Also, um, they take a lot of water to keep green in the summer if there's a drought. You know, you got to really, if you really care about your green, green grass, that's something you have to water. Also, people apply far too many um, fertilizers and herbicides to their yards so that when it rains, that excess will run off into our waterways, causing all sorts of problems. So, just a great idea to limit grass yards. Another reason to limit grass yards, or habitat at least, is that it doesn't provide much protection. It doesn't provide much food. So really, they are not great for wildlife. Um, so it's best to create um, multi-layered, very interesting habitats in your yard. Um, also, keep nesting needs in mind. So some plants will produce um, materials that are great for nests. So I know a lot of birds collect um, milkweed fluff in the spring for their nests from last year's pods that are opened. Um, you know, they, some species like grasses, this goes back to, you know, thinking about the type of birds you want in your yard and making sure you have the correct materials for them on hand. And last, do very minimal preparation of your, your garden in your yard for winter. Um, we have a lot of clients that just ask us to come and trim back some really big grasses and then they leave a lot of the perennial stalks behind so that there's a space for birds to stay protected in the winter. So that's one easy thing you can do. It's a lot less work for you um, unless you live in a neighborhood where you have an HOA or something and they require you to do certain types of maintenance. Do think about leaving some of it for the birds. Uh, another thing to think about is layers. Trey's going to talk a lot more about this in a few minutes, but I just wanted to put this in your brain. Um, this garden has a lot of beautiful different layers to it. It's got sort of ground covery sections. It's got some mid-sized um, perennials and shrubs and these tall grasses and also some trees. So there's lots of different spaces for birds that prefer different um, niches to be able to survive. There's my dogs barking. I think my husband's home. All right, so another thing when we talk about shelter is birdhouses. So I'm going to close my door real quick. It's not so loud. Pardon me. Um, so you see a lot of birdhouses for sale all over the place. Many of them are very garishly painted um, and they are maybe made, some are made of metal. Um, they're not breathable. So do know that not all birdhouses are created equal. Um, first off, there's nesting boxes and there's roosting boxes. So nesting boxes are important in the spring when they are nesting and raising their babies. 
Um, so on the lower right hand corner here, this is an example of a nesting box. And this is actually a really interesting birdhouse and I might get one for my yard. It's a convertible birdhouse. So you can make it into a nesting box in the spring and then convert it into a winter roosting box um, by changing the orientation of the door and adding some perches. So nesting, nesting, they want uh, most species who use boxes like a deeper sort of cavity, they go and build their nest at the bottom. When it comes to winter, they want to be where it's warm and heat rises. So they will perch up farther in here where the heat ri will rise up and keep them warmer. Um, another key factor about this birdhouse is that it is cleanable. You really don't want a birdhouse that you cannot open up to clean. Um, it's not very hygienic for the birds and they won't like it and they will not be healthy if that's the case. Um, also, size your box based on the type of bird you want to attract. So if you wanted to attract owls to your yard, this box is not going to do very good for you. Number one, they can't get in the hole, right? Different species have different size holes that they will go in and out of. And they can be a lot smaller than you think, but I doubt our traditional owls in Pennsylvania will be able to fit in one of these. Um, another thing about the size of holes in bird boxes is that if they're too large, um, different types of birds will come in and sort of invade the space um, and take over. So keep that in mind as well. So a couple of things to look for. One, again, clean outdoors. Make sure you can either open up the bottom to clean it out or there's a side or in this case the front opens up so you can really get in there and, and you know, take out the old nest spray it out and get it clean. Um, appropriately sized entrance holes. Um, this is really important. The wood can't be treated. Um, you don't want anything that has been luminized, um, etc. It's better to stick to just a natural pine. It won't last as long, um, but if you want to kind of protect it, you can paint it with a muted um, acrylic paint, um, nothing oil-based or really toxic. Um, just on the outside to kind of protect that wood if you want to. And also if you're building your own house, um, you can put wood glue in the joints that will not need to be open and that really helps to seal things up as well. Muted colors. Um, you know, birds don't like to be in really bright, brightly painted houses. Um, they don't want to A, attract prey, but B, it's just, you know, it's just nice for them to have a space that sort of blends in and they're more comfortable going to those. All right, and last for me is water. Um, we all need water to survive. Birds need it for hydration. They need it for bathing. Um, and they really like moving water. So these are a couple of examples here from high tech to low tech. Um, at the top right, we've got what's called a water wiggler, um, which I think is just the funniest little thing. You put it, that's on three legs, you put it in your bird bath and it moves the water around so that the birds will be attracted to it and will be more likely to come to your space. Um, it also helps if you have moving water to protect from mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes like stagnant water. Lower right, this is a really cute little bird fountain. Um, it's got a pump that circulates and it's solar powered. So you don't have to add anything, you just let it go and it does its thing. And on the very low tech version, this is, um, I believe, an orange juice container that they've hung up over their bird bath. And all they did was poke two pinholes in it, one at the bottom so that the water could drip out, and then one at the top of the neck of the bottle so that it would have um, airflow so it would drip. Um, and that's just very simple. So think dripping. Um, again, the water wiggler, which is just the cutest thing. Um, and heated bird baths is really important too. Um, in the winter, you think, okay, well, there's a, there's a stream nearby, they're fine. But if it's a small stream, it's gonna freeze over um, and or be dry for a lot of the time. Um, we had that problem last last winter a lot. Some of the streams that I sample in Nine Mile Run that are usually flowing prolifically in the winter really um, went away. So keep that in mind too. Oh, and one last thing, cats. Um, this is a very determined cat on the right here. He has jumped onto this tiny, tiny pine branch and is trying to get into the bird feeder because birds equal food. Um, cats are really prolific predators to birds and they're responsible for more bird deaths than anything else in the US at this point. Um, so you wanna protect the birds 
protect the feeders with these lovely cone shaped things that go over the bottom. You can also put things like pieces of stove pipe, you know, slippery things that the cats can't climb. And also you can just embarrass your cat. Um, this cat at the bottom left doesn't look very happy about this brightly colored um, Elizabethan collar it has on, um, but that's always an option as well. Some people put bells on their cats. Um, personally, I've never had much luck with that. My cat would walk into the house carrying a bird wearing its bell collar. So um, that's up to you, uh, but please protect your birds from your cat. All right, try it. You're on. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about some layers and some plants, um, which are my favorite things. I will try not to take up all the time. <laughs> um, so we want to create, uh, um, you know, vertical layers because different habitats are going to attract different wildlife. So we're going to use a variety of different plant groups like um, conifer or coniferous trees, shrubs, um, vines, grasses, ferns. Um, we want to plant a variety of species within each plant group, like flowering dogwoods. So you have the flowering dogwood, the silky dogwood, the gray dogwood. You could even do um, creeping dogwood. All of those have a fruit and are going to offer food through the year. Um, you also want to use plants that are going to give you flowers and fruits throughout the entire season. Um, so serviceberry and elderberry, they give you uh, summer berries. The dogwoods give you fall berries. And then your American holly and your winterberry, those are going to give you winter berries. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some habitat niches every bird has its preferred space to nest and feed um, some birds prefer to feed on the ground like the robin but nest in a overstory tree um, so having those different places for them to nest and feed is really going to increase the species that are going to come into your yard um, and these are the layers that we're going to talk about. The overstory, the understory, the shrub, and then the perennial and ground layer. So overstory tree layer, those are your big trees. So 50 feet or taller, um, like the eastern white pine, um, the sweet gum, um, your red maple, and some of the birds that you would find in those overstories are the American crow, the blue jay, uh, you know, cedar waxwing, red-tailed hawk. The sweet gum is a fast-growing tree. It grows about one to two feet a year. It can grow up to 120 feet tall. Um, you'll see those leaves, they're beautiful fall color, they're star-shaped, and then they have that spiky kind of seed capsule that will feed, whoops, where's my notes? At least 21 different species will eat those, those seed capsules. Um, cardinals, morning doves, and red-winged blackbirds. The understory layer, those are kind of our medium to tall trees. So hawthorn, serviceberry, redbud, sassafras. Um, uh, Downy serviceberry, which is not listed there. That is great. It grows 20 to 40 feet tall, sun to part shade, um, prefers well-drained soil, but not dry. Uh, it has white flowers in the early spring to midsummer, So you're gonna attract a lot of pollinators to that. Um, and then it has a small purple fruit, which feeds at least 19 species of birds, including woodpeckers um, and these birds, the American Robin, the Morning Dove, the Goldfinch, those birds like to nest in those understory trees. The shrub layer. So those are kind of the small trees or shrubs, um, 20 feet or less. So we have the staghorn sumac, which I think feeds 98 different species of birds just on that fruit right there that you can see in the picture on the top. Um, we have witch hazel, 
which is great because that's a fall bloomer. Um, so that's kind of a late in the season nectar source. Um, spice bush, which is one of my favorites. That's native to Pennsylvania. Um, it grows about 18 to 15 feet tall, about two to eight feet wide. Um, does well in full sun to part shade. In the spring, it has these really teeny tiny, like greenish yellow flowers that are kind of attached to the branches there. Um, and the leaves actually give off this spicy odor if they're crushed. Um, it's also the host plant to the spice bush swallowtail. And something really important about the spice bush is that its fruits are very high in fat. So that makes it a really high wildlife value plant to have in your space. Um, birds in the shrub layer, mockingbird, cardinal, or hummingbird. Um, so then we move to the next layer down, you have vines and grasses. Um, so native trumpet honeysuckle, Virginia creeper, which most people think, you know, it's just this annoying weed. It's actually native. Again, it has a high wildlife value. It feeds at least 35 species on its berries, which you can see down there on the right hand corner. Um, those berries are in the late summer, usually last through the winter. Um, oh, it has the best fall color if it's in full sun. Um, you do not want to plant that somewhere where it's going to attach itself to your house because it can damage your siding and your gutters and stuff. So, you know, if you plant it in the backyard where it can kind of creep up a tree or creep up a barn, fine. Um, let's see. We have... Hmm. Sorry about that. My computer just went off. Um, our next layer is the perennial ground layer. So this is an important layer. This one, you know, you want to have a lot of different um, plants in there. You want to have a lot of variety because the more plant variety you have, the more wildlife variety you're going to have. So you're going to increase your biodiversity. Um, it's important to have flowering perennials like spring, summer, fall, because this is going to provide nectar source for insects, butterflies. You're going to bring all those pollinators, which is going to increase the natural food supply for birds. Um, I read that a single pair of chickadees will feed 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to their young in a season. That's a lot of caterpillars. So we need a lot of flowers. Um, it's also good to have plants of different textures. Rose mentioned milkweed and the birds using the tuft from the seeds to line their nests. Um, cinnamon fern, um, hummingbirds have actually taken the fronds from the cinnamon fern and used that to line their nests. Uh, I think goldfinches, also use the um, milkweed tuff in their nest. So a lot of different, you know, materials and textures, um, twigs, moss, uh, lichens, which you usually find on like your crab apples, your dogwoods. Um, hummingbirds love to pick those off and line those with their nest. It's really great camouflage. Um, so I've listed some perennials here uh, that are seasonal. Um, so columbine is early, your milkweed is your summer, uh, jack in the pulpit is great. The berries also are high in uh, fat for birds. We have two ground covers there. That is a, the creeping dog. What is the pictured one? Bunchberry. Um, partridge berry and also our native cactus, the eastern prickly pear. Um, has a beautiful yellow flower in the spring, it attracts the native green sweat bee. Um, morning doves have also actually made their nests in the prickly pear, because it offers some protection from predators. Um, and you will probably see blue violet everywhere, like in the crack of a sidewalk, um, through your lawn. This is a really important plant to keep 
it has it is a host plant to over 30 species of fritillaries um so that one plant is supporting all of those butterflies and lay those butterflies are then laying their caterpillars which are going to support all of those bird species um, and i've listed some ground nesting birds um, so killdeer, oven bird, song sparrow, morning dove, these are the ones that are going to be making their nests in those perennials and in the ground layer. Um, also part of the ground layer, brush piles, dead leaves. Um, the dead leaves are material for nests. Also, if you leave the dead leaves, they will, um, Lightning bugs actually lay their larvae in dead leaves. So the next season, you will have a ton of lightning bugs in your yard. Um, brush piles and the dead leaves and the twigs and everything like that, those offer habitat for the insects, like our local uh, bees and beetles and stuff. They actually will overwinter in them as well. Um, so next, we're going to talk about feeding through the season. So springtime, um, it's a really important time because most of the food has been consumed during the winter and then comes spring, the female birds are, you know, prepping to lay eggs and they need a lot of calcium. So one thing you can do is add crushed eggshell or a finely crushed um, oyster shell at your feeding station. You can just put those in a little uh, platform feeder, little dish off to the side. Um, eggshells are great you know you've got them in your refrigerator they actually offer 80 to 90 percent calcium and the oyster shells are about 35 percent calcium um, if you use eggshells you should boil them for 10 minutes or you want to heat them in the oven for 20 minutes let them cool then you crush them into smaller pieces about the size of a sunflower seed and then you can put them out at your feeder in a dish um, summertime, that is when food is, you know, that's the greatest period of food requirements because we have migrant birds coming through, they're going to store up for their long journey back. We have all the fledglings now, they require high protein, um, we have all of our pollinators. so. We really want to like beef up our garden with you know our trees our shrubs if you don't have the space for trees and shrubs um, definitely start adding some perennials even annuals um, really bring in those insects um, also Rose mentioned water it's important to have a source of water um, you also want to make sure that you clean your bird bath um, daily, uh, you know, just to keep it from, one, if you don't have a water wiggler, you don't want mosquitoes breeding in there. Um, and also just to keep it clean, keep the birds from getting any kind of diseases or, you know, not good. Um, let's see. Fall, again, that's the time for, you know, the birds populations are at the highest. Again, the migrants are getting ready to journey on. Oops, sorry about that. Um, also, birds are replacing tiny little flight and body feathers. So that process requires a lot of um, food, a lot of energy to do that. So we really want to make sure that we're providing them with, you know, the natural food source with the insects and the butterflies and stuff, but also it's okay to put out some sunflower seeds, um, you know, to start filling up your feeders with Niger seeds. These are really gonna help build up the fat reserves. And then winter time. So most of the natural food sources are gone. Um, you know, if you don't cut back your perennials and you're leaving the seed heads there, like your coneflowers, uh, you'll see the goldfinch kind of picking at the seeds. Um, but this is the time we really want to um, offer supplemental food. Um, dawn and dusk are when birds are, you know, 
the most active in foraging. So you want to make sure that your feeders are out then. You also, if you're in the country like me, you want to make sure that you're taking your feeders down in the early evening so you don't find them on the ground <laughs> because of a raccoon or a bear, you know. Um, what was that? Put the whole thing down. Um, and then I like to make my own suet. Um, and I can actually share a list of resources, some really good books, um, also some suet recipes, um, some different places that you can kind of hang the suet. And because everybody loves suet, squirrels, raccoons, everybody. Um, but it's a great way to offer uh, fat for birds, you know, by adding some lard or bacon fat, um, the peanut butter, you know, you're really helping them build up those reserves. Um, I did have some bird seeds to talk about. Um, so you can use a thistle feeder with some niger seeds. You're going to attract uh, finches and sparrows, um, black oil sunflower, Everybody loves that. That's also high in fat. Um, that's going to attract your cardinals, your chickadees, finches, blue jays, woodpeckers. Um, also, don't forget about the ground feeders. So sprinkling some millet or cracked corn on the ground, you'll get some juncos, some sparrows, some morning doves. Um, it is important to rake the seed. You don't want it to sit there too long. It'll actually get moldy. This could cause some health issues for the birds. This will also attract some unwanted visitors like raccoons and um, I do like possums though. They can come to my yard. <laughs> um, safflower is great for cardinals, uh, chickadees, peanuts are going to be great for your nuthatches, woodpeckers. Um, you want to get your feeder at least five feet off the ground. You just want to keep it at least three feet away from your window to uh, any windows to avoid um, window strikes. Um, another way to avoid window strikes is to buy these, they're little decals and you can actually just stick them on the window and this will break up that, um, reflected image that a bird sees and will, you know, deter them from hitting the window. Um, and there's a lot of different types of feeders. You've got your tube feeder, which chickadees and tip mice and fish finches use, um, your hopper feeders. Those are great for the bigger birds like cardinals and jays and uh, red winged blackbirds. And then your suet feeders are great for birds that like to cling, like woodpeckers and nuthatches and chickadees. Um, squirrel baffles, it's, I would say the one way to deter squirrels are the, using the squirrel baffles and using a feeder called a squirrel buster. It's sort of like a feeder inside of a cage and when a squirrel or even a heavy bird like a starling lands on that feeder the cage drops down and closes the ports so they actually can't get in and like demolish the food supply um, i've also added a slinky to my bird pole <laughs> um, to keep the squirrels off and it's entertaining to watch them bob up and down on that um, they have gotten past it they're very smart and very determined um, it's important to keep the feeder near a source of cover. So if the bird feels threatened, if there's a uh, hawk lurking around in a tree or the neighborhood cat is coming through, they need some space that they can immediately get to and hide. Um, so having it sort of close to a tree or a shrub, um, but not so close that the squirrels are just leaping off of that and right onto your feeders. And um, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions you folks have. Um, so there's a couple of just comments here. So there's a couple questions. Um, number one, Sarah Silk was looking to have you list the dogwood and berry trees again. You were listening. Which I think is at the beginning of your presentation. Give me one second.
Um, oh, so serviceberry, um, elderberry, uh, spice bush, um, winterberry. Um, the dogwoods are flowering dogwood, gray dogwood, silky dogwood, um, and bunchberry or creeping dogwood. Um, I can create a list and Rose can send it out to everybody as well. Yeah, we'll put that in our list of our resource document. Yeah. Um, another question is from Anne um, about, um, uh, it, so that I've heard it's not good to fill feeders with bird seed dried fruits, even good quality over summer because the birds don't need these in the summer. Is that true? Um, there's been a, so there's a lot of controversy of over whether or not you should feed birds during the summertime, um, whether it affects their migratory patterns or it keeps, you know, keeps them from, it keeps them dependent on you. Um, however, there's, I haven't seen a lot of research. I haven't seen a lot of like science-based studies saying otherwise. Um, I personally don't fill my feeders all the time in the summer. I have a ton of um, trees and shrubs and perennials that are blooming. Um, I will occasionally put out some black oil sunflower. I maybe put like half a feeder uh, just to kind of get the birds coming in. And my cats also enjoy watching them. I do. Um, but I really, really feed heavily in the winter time. Um, you know, you could check Audubon Society, um, Feeder Watch is another one, uh, Citizen Science, they do um, like the Christmas bird count. They have a lot of good articles on their websites. Um, so you might find some information on that. Great. Um... So Anne Jane is looking for suggestions on where to buy these plants and shrubs we mentioned. Um, a lot of these native plants you can buy from the Audubon Society um, at Beechwood Farms and Fox Chapel. Um, you can also find some of these at your local nursery or garden centers. Um, if you do use the nursery, I would suggest that you take a list and you write down the botanical name. Um, because what some people think is, you know, milkweed, someone else calls it, uh, monarch flower. So having the botanical name, there's no confusion and you're going to get the right plant. Um, but Roxanne Swan at the Audubon Society is great. Uh, they propagate all of their native plants there from seed. Um, and they have over, I want to say 130 different species of native plants in Pennsylvania. Um, plus, you're also helping the Audubon Society, which is great. Yeah. If you're looking for really large quantities of something for a large space, there are native nurseries you can order from, but um, then you have to be expensive. And also, you just have to order a really big quantity of something. Um, so um, we'll I see a question about squirrels. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Squirrel Buster has been great for me. Um, it is a little expensive, but they have a lifetime warranty on that. Um, I actually had a squirrel knock it down and bend the cage, and I emailed the manufacturer, and they sent me a new one. Um, so you do pay a little more, but you get that warranty, and that's one of the ones where if the squirrel or a heavy bird lands on it, it drops down over the ports, and they can't actually get in there. Um, Droll Yankee makes a couple different... Um, squirrel feeders uh there's a really big one that the squirrel will actually spin off of um i found that the squirrel buster is fine it comes in different sizes you can get a really small one um if you just have a balcony and you don't really have a yard space but you want to feed birds um i think it holds <sighs> like a pound of seed or something like that um but i can make a list of uh resources with you know the plants um some books even feeders, uh, bird seed. Um, we have talked about uh, Nine Mile Run actually um, selling bird seed in the winter time. So I would encourage you guys to keep an eye on our website and our newsletter um, for when we start doing that. Um, um, the question about deer here. I mean, 
you know, deer aren't um, an issue for birds per se, but for your garden, there are certain species of plants that you can put in that they do not like to eat. Um, so you can probably- Yes. Um, I will never say that nothing is uh, deer resistant <laughs> because I've Ooh, seen a deer actually bite the prickly pear cactus. Um, so I have noticed that they tend to leave native plants alone. Um, and they go for the more um, exotic stuff in your garden. So planting natives can help. Also um, planting some fragrant stuff around those plants in your garden, some um, thyme, uh, some lavender, because once it's crushed, it releases that fragrance and they don't particularly care for that. Um, there are also some sprays that are non-toxic, uh, that are kind of all natural. Um, they're basically essential oils. Um, so you could kind of spray those. That can get expensive because once it rains, it washes off and then you have to continually spray. Um, so I would say look for some fragrant things and try to go more native. Um, just do the best you can. I know that they're a pest. Mm. Um, you're saying that your empty feeders are too low. I'd say, again, that's of, um, putting them up high enough and also if you hang them off a tree off a branch then there's nothing for them to support themselves on and they can't feed yeah um i see a question about winterberry mm -hmm. uh you can find that at a local nursery or garden center that is um ilex for tisalata is the botanical name um, beautiful red berries in the winter. Great. Any other last questions? Feel free to put them in the, in the chat box. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, everybody. We really appreciate having you here with us um, and been some great, great questions. Um, and you have my email, um, so please feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or comments um, or something else that you'd like to share with the group. We are always open to that as well. Um, we are a community. We don't, we don't pretend to be, you know, super experts. There's always something else you can learn. Well, Trey's a pretty good expert on plants, but. <laughs> well, we're I'm just a plant geek. I uh, love stuff. all things nature, so. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will try to make this presentation available. Um, I usually have to post it to YouTube privately just because it's such a big file. Um, but if that happens, I will be sure to share the link with you. And then you can share that link with whoever you feel that you'd like to share it with. Um, we'll also be putting together that list of resources over the next few days to a week. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, but please note that we're both really busy this week. So if we don't get it to you right away, um, it is coming, we promise. Um, all right, Trey, anything else to add before we end the call? Um, no, just happy gardening and happy birding. Yeah. Um, of course, we have to put a plug in here. If you're interested in a rain garden with native plants that will attract birds, um, of course, come to us. We would love to help you with that. Um, we always have to put that in there at the end. Um, <laughs> we'll be proud of us for that. Um, but yeah, and keep your eyes open in case we start selling bird seed. We'd love to have have y'all um, join us in feeding the birds this winter. So, all right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the call. To stop sharing and the call, and we'll get off. And have a great night, everybody. Bye. Thanks.